Let's open with prayer. Our Father, what a blessing it is that we can be anywhere and turn to your word. That we can be any place on earth and hear and teach your word. Father, we pray that we'll be good stewards of this hour in this place this morning. As we turn to your word in John chapter 14, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I've really been excited about turning to the passage of our concern as we just arrive uh, today at the Gospel of John chapter 14. And uh, having already covered the first paragraph of chapter 14, we now are going to pick up at verse 8. And what we're going to be looking at is one of the most under-understood passages of the Gospel of John. And of course, as we reach John chapter 14, we are clearly headed towards the cross and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thus we have the intensification of energy and of message. But there's something particular going on here in this passage, and I'm just going to read it. And, uh, and, And as I read it, see if you can sense what it is that is happening that most evangelical Christians don't see as it happens. Gospel of John, chapter 14, beginning at verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son." If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. The history of evangelical preaching and interpretation hastens to the last portion of this text this morning. To Jesus' pointing to his works and then the promise to the disciples that there were even greater works and whatever work they set to do, if they do in Christ's name, uh, he will do it. What they race past is actually one of the most shocking passages in the Gospel of John. Now, we've already seen some of these. We, 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 we've seen passages that are, are to shock us because there's something here that is so unexpected and disclosive, it is in one sense embarrassing. And that's another part of the ironic character of the Gospel of John. John doesn't hide what should be deserved embarrassment from the disciples. And, and that's reassuring to us because, again, we, we tend to think, even as Protestants, evangelical Protestants, we tend to think of a certain hagiography when it comes to the disciples and the apostles. We, we tend to think they were, they were always keen. Uh, they were always alert. They didn't miss things. Uh, they had the privilege of hearing from Jesus himself and thus in an unmediated way. Uh, they would have absolutely understood everything Jesus said and everything Jesus was. And, and they've been with Jesus by this point for three years of sustained tutelage, three years of sustained discipleship, three years in which even we would expect, just as the body of Christ, we would expect new believers giving themselves attentively to the preaching of God's word to demonstrate a pretty remarkable growth in three years' time. And and the history of the early church, especially in the book of Acts, will reveal they had grown a great deal, remarkably. But at the same time, right here on the threshold of the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus, Philip the apostle is revealed by his question. And the response of Jesus actually points us to the fact that there's a lot more going on here than any casual reading of the text would indicate. First of all, it just begins rather flatly that Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. 
Now, this is right after Jesus had spoken the earlier words we have in this discourse. And you go back to chapter 14, verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. So there's a parallelism. Believe in God the Father, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Now remember, he says, you know the way to where I am going. But it's Thomas who then says, Lord, how can we know? We do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So you'll notice there is a, a double perplexity here on the part of the disciples. You had the perplexity of Thomas, and now you had the perplexity of Philip. And you would think that had Philip been listening carefully to Jesus' response to Thomas, he would have understood not to ask the question or to make the statement that he made asking Jesus to show the Father. Jesus has already, in John chapter 12 and chapter 13, spoken increasingly of his identity with the Father, and then has classically spoken of the fact that the Father's glorified in him and he is glorified in the Father. They share the same glory, and so we know all that. But now Philip asks the question, or he poses the request, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus has just said, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, one of the most important verses for our understanding of Christ, our understanding of the gospel, our understanding of, of the unity of biblical truth is when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And then he, he says, you have seen me you have seen the Father. Because, because I am with you, now you do know him and have seen him. That then raises the question, what, what is on Philip's mind when one verse later he says, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. It must be that Philip, even paying close attention to the discourse of Jesus and listening to him attentively. Just imagine the pressure. We, we know how much pressure was already present. We know the threat of arrest, the hostility of the Jewish authorities. All of this is already abundantly clear. And Jesus has been speaking. The fact is, hour has now come. After years of saying, my hour has not yet come. Now he says, my hour has come. We've already had the final supper. We've already had the announcement of betrayal. Jesus is, Judas has already been sent away to do what he must do quickly. Jesus is speaking with an unusual intimacy, and it's going to be an intimacy that will continue throughout the next chapters, all the way to the cross. But now, after Thomas has said, how can we know the way? We don't know the way. And Jesus said, you know me, so you know the way. And then Jesus went on further and said, if you know me, you know the Father, and now you have known him and seen him. And Philip says, but Jesus, it will be enough if you just allow us to see the Father. You know, well, what's, what's going on here? Well, here's a theological category that is common only to biblical Judaism and Christianity. It is the theophany, the appearance of God, the manifestation of God. It is a bush that burns and is not consumed. It is the glory of God in the cleft of the rock. It is God showing up. It's not a vision. It's not a dream. It's the actual presence of God in his creation 
in an appearance known as a theophany, and the rare character of a theophany is what makes it so utterly amazing. Moses could not ignore the bush that burned and was not consumed. He could not but obey the voice that came from the midst of the fire. He later, of course, famously wanted to see God's glory, and he was able to see God's glory passing by. A theophany was Israel's greatest hope. There were theophanies of a sort in the column of fire and and of smoke and the presence of God in the tabernacle and in the temple, but these were not from which voice came. It was the voice who came to Moses, the voice who spoke from the midst of the fire that came from the bush that was yet not consumed. It had been many, many, many centuries since Israel had experienced a theophany. Israel has been praying for a theophany. Israel has been praying for an appearance. You see this in the Psalms, actually. You see this in the prophets. You see this in a passage like Isaiah 60. They are longing for a theophany. And they've been promised a theophany. And even in the Old Testament, now we can go to the Old Testament and see that the theophany they were promised is an incarnational theophany. Unto you a child is born. Unto you a son is given. There will be a king who will rule forever from David's throne, promise after promise after promise. Philip does not understand yet that Jesus Christ is not only the fulfillment of those promises. He is the theophany. Our joy this morning in turning to this passage is to reflect upon what it means that Jesus Christ is himself and was from the very moment of his incarnation the theophany. We do not look for a theophany. We do not ache to see the Father. Because to see Jesus is to see the Father. To have Jesus is to have the Father. To know the glory of Christ is to know the glory of the Father. Now, behind all of that is the intertrinitarian mystery of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, of course, the Holy Spirit's coming so quickly in the, in, the, in the passage here as he's being promised shortly after the very conversation that we are, we are considering. But we need to ponder what it means that Jesus himself is the theophany. And, and you see it right here in the passage where Jesus' response to Philip is immediate. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? And it would be easier to understand if Jesus hadn't just said all that he just said. He he just said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's just said, but now you know him and have seen him. And it's almost as if Philip, on behalf of the others, that's almost always the case in all four of the Gospels. When one disciple asks a question, it's almost always on behalf of all the disciples. I don't mean that had to be orchestrated. It's just natural. What, in the flow of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, when a disciple asks a question, it's not that the others are able to answer the question. Only Jesus can answer the question. That's the point. And uh, this is encouraging to us about not only the, the fact that Jesus isn't offended when we ask such questions, but that others are probably asking these questions, and it's a good thing for us to overhear one another asking these questions. But in this case, Thomas's question was awkward, and now Philip's question is awkward, but Jesus isn't responding so much in personal peak or a dismissal as he actually seizes it as the opportunity. His, his response to Philip is, have you been with me all this time, and, and, and you don't know me? His words may express a bit of frustration, but more than anything else, it just points to the fact that the disciples have missed it. Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? 
It's an amazing passage. Jesus says, how can, you, how can you turn to me, look to me, and say, show me the Father? If you look at me, you're seeing the Father. I've already told you to see me is to see the Father. I and the Father are one. If you see me, you see the Father. Philip, listen to these words. If you see me, you see the Father. He doesn't use the word theophany. That's a word that we use of an appearance of God. Again, not a vision, not not an appearance in the sense of something that someone has merely seen as an illusion, but an actual appearance in the created order of God's presence and his glory. Jesus is as the bush that burns and is not consumed. Jesus is the the light, the fire, the voice. And they've been with him all these years. Moses was only able to get a glimpse of the backside of God passing by. The disciples have been with Jesus all this time, face to face, gathered around a fire, preaching in a field, sharing meals. To see him is to see the Father. And the conversation continues, Jesus continues by saying, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Again, what a verse. Just ponder this for a moment. it's, It's not, do you not know that if you see me, you have a pretty good idea of what the Father looks like? You have some hint of the divine reality and the divine majesty. To see me is to have an increased and heightened awareness of deity. Jesus doesn't say that. He says, if you see me, you see the Father. And it's because I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. The preposition is astounding. It doesn't say like. It doesn't say similar to. It doesn't say roughly the same as. He says in Now, this is a part of the Trinitarian mystery, what it means for the Father to be in the Son and the Son to be in the Father. But at least it means this, to see one is to see them all. Because for them to be in each other means that, even as we rightly must separate the three persons of the Trinity, we cannot separate them from each other. We distinguish but the Father is in the Son. And the Son is in the Father. Well, this is such good news to us. Because that means that if we have access to Christ, we have access to the Father. And it's not just that through Christ we gain peace with the Father and reconciliation with the righteous Father. That's, of course, true. But it's actually that in Christ we have the Father. He is the way to the Father. He is himself in the Father. Now, all of this will be made urgently clear in John 17 in the high priestly prayer of Jesus. But right now, this is about Philip and Philip's request. And Jesus is saying, how can you have been with me all this time and now you say to me, show us the Father and Notice those other words, it will be enough. Enough. It will be enough. Of course it would be enough. It it would be enough to catch the barest glimpse of the Father. It would be enough. It was enough for Moses alone on behalf of all of Israel to be hidden into the cleft of the rock and been able to see the backside of God passing by. It was enough for all of Israel's existence, for Moses himself to hear from the bush that burned but was not consumed. Then all of the disciples have been with Jesus. And then the New Testament tells us that the mystery of our salvation is such that we are adopted by the Father as joint heirs with Christ. We are ourselves in Christ. We are indivisible from Christ. The church is described as his bride, inseparable from him, and in the body of Christ, so that now... Those who are in the church are in the mystery of the gospel, in that sense, in Christ. And if we are in Christ, 
then we are with the Father. And if we see Christ, we see the Father. Now, this also gets to the mystery of evangelical preaching. We point people to Christ. We preach Christ. We preach Christ crucified. This is the mystery of the gospel, as the Apostle Paul will make very clear to the Corinthians. But when we preach Christ, we are preaching the Father. We, we, we cannot preach the Son without preaching the Father. And to preach Christ is to show people the Father. If we show them Christ, we show them the Father. And that's the mystery of evangelical preaching. That's why the preaching of God is the preaching of Christ. And the preaching of Christ is the preaching of God. The text continues. As Jesus is speaking directly, of course, to Philip, but that means to all the disciples, and that means to us. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Okay, very interesting. Little turn in, in the point Jesus is making here. He says that... Uh, Nothing he says is on his own authority. And we, we've heard him say that before. But nothing he says is on his own authority. He speaks on the Father's authority. So it, 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 the Father's voice is in Jesus. That's another good thing for us to know, isn't it? Let, let's just say that out loud to each other. Jesus' voice is the Father's voice. So if Jesus says something, the Father is saying it through the Son. Or actually, the preposition, let's be careful, the Father is saying it in the Son. And, and that means that when we hear Jesus, we are hearing the Father, that they, they are the same voice. The authority on which Jesus speaks is not his own authority, even as the incarnate Son of God. It is rather the authority of the Father. He has no will, he tells us, but to do the will of the Father. He says nothing but what the Father wills him to say. So, Philip, when I ask you, have you been with me all this time, and yet you do not know me? Have you been listening to me all this time and thought you were listening to me? You've been listening to the Father the whole time. Who, who do you think is speaking? Am I speaking? Yes. But when I speak, the Father speaks because I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. Now, again, I started out by saying I think most evangelical Christians have never actually looked to a passage like this and recognize how thermonuclear these verses are because this changes everything. This is, this is, this is the mystery of Trinitarian Christianity, but it, it's, it's actually the essence of Christianity itself. This is our Christology right here. And, and it, it certainly also prevents us as Christ prevented Philip, it prevents us from looking for the Father anywhere but in the Son. That's a really good corrective. That's a part of what Jesus is saying to Philip here. How dare you look for the Father but in me? And again, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We look nowhere else. But it's not just that we look nowhere else because there's no one else. It's because we look nowhere else because to see Christ is to see the Father. To hear Christ is to hear the Father. We're not longing for another voice. We're not longing for a theophany. Have you ever thought about that? Israel's just aching for a theophany. The prophets were saying there will be one in God's timing. He hasn't abandoned us. There will be a theophany in appearance. Now, what were the clues that we should know? What, what, should, what should Philip have known? Well, you could root some of this in the prophetic expectation about which I've spoken. But also think of the very name given to Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Not God-like with us, not merely the way to God with us, not merely someone God-like with us, but God with us. That's the theophanic language right there. It's God with us. So even this baby who is named Emmanuel, God with us, is it's like you just named him Theophany. This is, this is who he is. This is little Theophany here. And, and then 
what language would you think would be associated with this child if this child were the theophany? Well, it would be the exact language you find in the prophets foretelling the coming of Christ, and it's exactly the language that you find in the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels concerning Christ, concerning the baby Jesus. When the glory shone round about them, it was the glory of the Father in the infancy of his Son. And again and again, this, this context of theophany comes clearly. It was a theophany that was announced to the shepherds. It's a theophany that drew the magi. It's a, it's a theophany that took place in the most unlikely of places. But then every theophany did. A bush that was burning and not consumed in the middle of the wilderness, far, far, far from the land of promise. That appearance when Moses was in the cleft of the rock, as Israel was wandering in the wilderness, and now in lowly Bethlehem, in a lowly place within lowly Bethlehem, the glory of God is revealed in excelsis Deo. We think of the baptism of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus turned out to be a theophany that was audible to everyone who could hear. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The Spirit of God appearing as a dove well, there you have it. It's a theophany. And people must have known at the time that it was a theophany, but perhaps only later did they connect the dots. One of the most interesting dimensions of what it means for us to look at the life and ministry of Jesus in the New Testament and see a theophany is when all of a sudden something jumps out at us as being theophanic or a, a theophany that maybe we didn't catch. So uh, think of a passage. Well, let's just think of an incident in the life of Jesus when he walked on water. What did it mean for Jesus to walk on water? You know, this is a matter of comedy routines. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a miracle cliche in the larger world. But what did it mean for Jesus to walk on the water? You say, well, it showed his divine character. It's at least he could do supernatural works. Yes, yes, but why walking on water? Why not flying through the air? Why walking on water? Well, it probably has everything to do with Genesis 1, verse 2, when the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. Turns out there were theophanies throughout the works of Christ. That's why, even as Philip asked the question and Jesus says, I am the theophany. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. He shifts to the works. And, and that just points to us to the fact that the works of Christ were actually the theophany being manifested. And here's just the example, you know, the walking on water. Where did that idea come from? Why, why that and not something else? It is because those who know Torah, we know of the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the deep. And now God in human flesh is walking over the face of the deep. In retrospect, you go, oh my goodness, I should have seen that. I should have seen that. Which means every one of us is named Philip. And that's a good thing for us to know too. We miss more than we catch. It's one of the reasons why we have to keep studying the Bible over and over and over again and studying the same text over and over and over again because we miss more than we catch. And, and for one thing, it, 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 takes, it takes a lot of biblical 
awareness to be able to say, oh, I can connect John 14 with Genesis 1. There must be a connection. Or I can, I, I can, I can go to Jesus walking on water, and then I can go back to Genesis. It takes long acquaintance with Scripture. It also takes an ongoing conversation with people who are studying the Word of God. That's why when we are seriously studying the Bible, we want to go to other faithful Christians who've also studied the Bible. That's why any preacher rightly getting ready to preach or to teach the Bible or anyone doing what I'm doing will go and say, what have other faithful Christians taught of this before? What, what will I miss that I might not miss if I turn to another faithful believer who's been struggling with this and New Testament scholars who have worked with this? But if you do that, you'll also notice that almost every one of these commentary writers misses more than he gets. And so you get a bunch of them together and you get more because you miss less. And through the history of the Christian church, it's a matter of every generation, missing a lot, but passing on much. And when the recovery of something like this comes, it's, it's glorious because in the middle of Christ's church, all of a sudden it's as if the glory of Christ shines greater. It means a lot more to me this morning having prepared to talk about this text, to ponder Christ as the theophany of God. And the fact that right here is the very, it's a very fulcrum passage in which all of a sudden, okay, now everything makes sense, including the works. As, as Jesus made clear as he was speaking to Thomas, it, it's not Jesus changing the subject, it's Jesus making the point. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe on account of the works themselves. Now, before turning precisely to the works, let me just point you to two other aspects of the theophany of Christ, and that would be the transfiguration, which is very much parallel to the baptism. This is my beloved son. And the, the next is the crucifixion. And you, you may say, well, the crucifixion, how, how can that be a theophany? It is, in biblical theology, the theophany. When, it, when Jesus is displayed before the world on the cross, that is the display of the Son and the Father and the Father and the Son. And that's a part of the preaching of Christ's church. But Jesus points to the works. And he doesn't name any of the particular works here, but he, he speaks of the works. And that, that's John's other word for miracle. And so you've got sign and works, the, the, the works that I do. And, uh, and the word works is larger than sign, and that sign's almost exactly what we think of as miracle. It's an act that in itself is to point to uh, his divine nature. But in this case, the works are... The works that Jesus could do and could only do, the feeding of 5,000, the healing of the sick, you can just go down the whole list. And so the works were signs that did things, signs that had effects. And, and, but like the signs that were merely signs, the works point to who Jesus is and from the fact that he is, to the fact that he is from the Father. And what he could do is only possible because he is from the Father. And then Jesus goes on and speaks a remarkable passage. And it begins in verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Well, does he? This is one of those passages where we get just a little bit of nervousness because uh, you don't have to throw a stone too far before you'll find a church that will say this is exactly what it's all about. We're doing the works Jesus did because Jesus told us to do it and he said whatever that we do in his name he will do. We ask it and he will do it. Greater works. I've gone down the country road and passed the Greater Works Apostolic Church. Looks like a fairly small work, but 
Nonetheless, it named itself the Greater Work Apostolic Church. I've uh, heard plenty of TV preachers promise that all we have to do is X or Y in Jesus' name, and Jesus is honor bound to do it. Well, is that right or wrong? Well, it has to be right. <laughs> it has to be wrong. When Jesus talked about his works, and we have it right here in the Gospel of John, we, we can look at exactly what he was talking about. The, the main work is the work of preaching the kingdom. That's the main thing that we do. So before we get to anything like, uh, say, bringing back a dead person alive, we need to start with the main work that Jesus did and the main work to which we are called to do, and that's the preaching of the Word of God. And you know what? Whenever the Word of God is preached, Christ is present. Christ is present, the Father is present. And because He sent the Son, the Father and the Son have sent the Spirit when the Spirit is with us, the Spirit opens our hearts to believe, to see. This is the Holy Spirit-inspired Word. Preaching is a Trinitarian event. And it is a work. Preaching and teaching the Word of God is a work that we do in Jesus' name. And we get to preach to more people than Jesus ever got to preach to in his earthly ministry. We've seen the expansion of the church. We've seen the perseverance of the church, the protection and divine direction of the church. We've seen amazing things happen in the history of the church. So the greatest work to which preaching is directed is the conversion of souls. And that's a work we get to see. That's a work we long to see. That's a work that we celebrate in baptism more than in anything else. And we get to see that. We get to baptize in Jesus' name. Yes, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let's be clear. But we're doing this because Jesus told us to do it. It's an ordinance because he ordered it. And it's a work. And it's, it's, it's a work that we get to see to a far greater extent than even Jesus and his disciples saw in their earthly ministry. We've been able to see a baptized church made up of millions defy dictators, defy the devil, preach the word and take the gospel as they are even now to the ends of the earth. Other works we do because Christ did them works of healing. We pray for one another. We pray for those who are not even believers. Praying right now for the president and the first lady and a whole host of others who are infected with COVID-19. We, we pray. Now, Jesus assures us that greater works will be done by us, and whatever we ask in his name, he will do. But he never gives us the authority and or delegate sovereignty to determine exactly how this will be done and when and where and who. So we have plenty of permission indeed. We're authorized and commanded to pray for one another. And the greatest work is the work of healing that comes because he has healing in his wings. Ultimate healing that comes only by the gospel to those who are in Christ. We have to be very careful not to take this out of context. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples as he is headed to a cross and telling them that they're going to be called upon to do even greater works, but that they will do even greater works, and they will do so in his name. Well, how can he say that? How can he presume upon the Father's authority? Well, it is because he's speaking with the Father's authority because the Father is in him and he is in the Father. That means that in the promises of Jesus, there is no contingency. There, there's no, I will do the best I can do. I think this will generally work. There is no, the work I go now to do is to persuade the Father to do the right thing. No, there's none of that. 
Instead, in his session, seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, he ever intercedes for us, but he does not intercede for us against the will of the Father. But as the Father and the Son's will are one. The inner Trinitarian mystery is so far beyond us. But we have no excuse for knowing anything less than everything that's revealed in Scripture. And thus we're in the predicament of Philip, as we are also in the predicament of Thomas in this sense. But in this passage, we're in the predicament of Philip because if we're honest, we're often inclined to say the same thing, aren't we? Lord, show us the Father and it will be enough. And this is one of the reasons why we sing and say Christ is enough. This is a part of the sufficiency of Christ just because of his identity in the Father and the Father in him. In that sense, we should be just incredibly thankful that Philip asked this question. Because Jesus' response to this question which was itself a question, remember? Have you been with me all this time and still you do not understand? It makes us prompted by Philip look to the entirety of the Bible and say, what does it look like if God shows up? And why, as we conclude, why was a burning bush not enough? Why was the backside of God as Moses is hidden in the cleft of a rock not enough? Why is even a a glimpse of the glory of God in the Holy of Holies not enough? It's because we're only saved. Because when God showed up, He showed up in a son who would live a perfect life of obedience to the Father and would die on the cross as our substitute. And while he was with us, he showed us the Father. And now that we are in him, we are in him safe. For he is in the Father. And in that sense, then, so are we. He is the bridegroom, we are the bride. He is the Lord, and we are the body. And that is more than enough. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this passage. Father, never allow us to miss seeing you in your Son and knowing how that transforms our worship, our joy, our evangelism, our missions, everything. And Father, may it not be said at the end of our days, have you been with me so long and yet you have not known me? It will be, Father, by the communion of your people, by the work of the Holy Spirit, by the preaching of God's word, and it will be to your glory. And so to you and your glory we pray. Amen.